Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, uh, before uh, we get uh, started, I just wanted to take a, a, a brief moment to, uh, again, thank Avela Bank for their uh, kind and generous support of the CME programming here, uh, and uh, introduce uh, Kevin Geis and Rex Rorson from Avela, who uh, I think had a couple of introductory remarks, so uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Kevin and Rex. Thank you. Well, it's always an honor and a privilege to come before this group. Um, Rex and I have been doing it for a number of years, and Avela Bank is very excited to be one of the sponsors for uh, Grand Rounds, and very excited about this program uh, today. I'm excited to be educated. I'm excited to see that um, the uh, hospital is involved in some cutting edge activity that can bring real value to people um, that are in need. Uh, and the need that may be different than what we normally think as medical need. And so it's our privilege to be here today to support this, to support our medical community, and we're thankful that we have such a great medical community in Ames and Story County. So we ask you to enjoy the program, and we'll all leave better educated and better informed. I can't, I can't add to that. That was great. Uh, so today, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Don Bowker. Uh, Dr. Bowker uh, is the uh, Director of Nursing Education uh, and uh, Clinical Associate uh, Professor of Nursing at Iowa State University. Uh, she has over four decades of nursing experience. Uh, she uh, holds a PhD in nursing science uh, with a dual focus on nursing education and health disparities from New Mexico State University, and a master's degree in trans, uh, uh, transcultural nursing and uh, community from the uh, Aug Augsburg College in Minneapolis. Dr. Bowker is a women's health nurse practitioner with clinical experience of three decades in uh, both private and community sectors. She's worked as a transcultural clinician and a consultant on cultural discordance issues in healthcare delivery. Her passion for social determinants of uh, health uh, care delivery led her to uh, co-author a text, Social Determinants of Health in Nursing, Education Integrating into Curriculum and Practice. Uh, Dr. Barker is an advocate for uh, vulnerable populations and those who are underserved or whose services uh, or voices are often not heard. Her research focuses on the anthropological influences on healthcare decision making uh, among indigenous people, and uh, we're, we're very, very, very pleased that she was able to accept our invitation today to provide us with some insight on the social determinants of health and integrating it into clinical practice. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dawn Popper. Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction, and thank you for coming um, to talk about social determinants of health. Um, as was mentioned, this is cutting edge, and it is changing health care and how we look at health care. So um, hopefully we can provide some insights um, today. I want to just take a minute to introduce Carla Kirkhove. Um, here she is my colleague at Iowa State and the co-author of our text. Um, so thank you for joining me, Carla. Um, we're going to talk about social determinants of health integrating into clinical practice. There's um, three objectives today. Um, I think you probably have those, but talk about how, what is the interplay of social determinants of health and upstream factors and how they influence health disparities. We want to talk about social determinants of health domains uh, through an unfolding case study. Um, integrating, uh, that you can integrate into clinical practice. I will say the two case studies that we'll be discussing today are real life case studies. Um, I have the privilege of being an expert witness in court as a consultant um, when there is uh, discordance outcomes. So as we look at those, know that they're actual case studies. <clears throat> and then we're gonna translate how social determinants of health and implicit bias influence health and health outcomes. So first, let's start talking about social determinants of health. Social determinants of health are the areas where people live, work, play, age, worship, go to school, 
It's their environment that affects their health and where they live. Um, there are forces that include economic development, policy, neighborhood development, and the Healthy People 2030 identify five areas. And if we start here, the first one is access to quality education. So this includes things that can affect quality education, such as health literacy. This is kids who go to school and have a tummy ache on Monday morning because they didn't have food at home, enough food at home over the weekend. And so they go to the nurse's office in the morning, um, Monday morning, to get snacks. This includes kids who intentionally wet themselves during school because they have no other clothes at home and the nurses have a clothes closet at home. Those are at work in the office. Those things, including bullying, affect access to quality care and quality education. Kids who go to school hungry are not gonna focus on their education. Kids who don't have parents at home who are latchkey kids, who don't have someone to help them with education, that affects the access to care to a quality education. Health literacy, access to college tuition, those things affect quality education. When, oopsie. Um, here, if we talk about access to care, um, everyone should have access to quality of care. And this should be without, without bias when we see our patients. We're gonna uh, come back and talk to the, about this a lot more with our case study. But this is what's specifically related, and we're gonna have some other case studies that we can talk about how do you assess social determinants of health. And it needs to be more than just checking a box. And we're gonna talk about why it needs to be more than checking a box. Community and built environment, this is what do, what is the, what is the house that they live in? What is the quality of the house? Is there green space for these kids to play? There is a, a park that is in the Des Moines area. That is, a park, of course, is intended for kids, but kids were not able to access this park because there was some adult activity that was happening and it didn't feel safe. And so if kids don't have a safe place to go to play, that's going to affect their health. What this park did is they put a police presence, either a police car with an officer or a fire truck, so the kids could look at those, but that presence got rid of some of that adult activity that was happening. And I'm pleased to say that this is a kid park again, because they took time to identify why there was barriers for kids to use that. What about those who are, um, have physical limitations? Are the sidewalks in good repair? Are there ramps so they can use those, their wheelchair or walker or cane or even an unsteady gate to safely cross a road or go for a walk? The quality and built environment, what about food? A lot of neighborhoods with, um, who have lower incomes are food deserts. And if there's food, it's often fast foods. They're much less expensive than to buy or to travel to go get a salad or fruits or vegetables. So we look at quality of the built environment. We need to look at also what is the quality of housing? Is there air conditioning? Is there running water? We need to not assume that. What about the safety of the windows, air conditioning and heating? Social, um, social um, support in those neighborhoods. Are, is there police presence? Is there activity? Is there, um, bus, is there a bus stop so that they can transport? It is not uncommon for people who live in an area that is lower income to have to take their laundry to a laundromat. And you take your kids and you're carrying your laundry and most of them it's not uncommon for them not to dry their laundry because of cost. And then they're carrying the wet laundry and they're um, guiding their children on buses. What kind of structure do we have for them? What kind of support do we have to help them navigate that? And then the last one is um, access to finances. It is, again, the concern is there's not, a for with the minimum wage, you cannot raise a family 
on a minimum wage. And a lot of persons who are living in poverty will have two full-time jobs. And that means those kids are home alone. They're not getting as much support with homework. There's a lot of guilt, because there's no one that I know who doesn't want, if they're going to succeed at anything, they want it to be parenting. And they're not able to be with their kids all the time, or to assure that they're not eating the same thing every night that they can self-prepare. Or if they are going home to that neighborhood and build environment, is it a safe way for them to get to point A to point B? And are they safe then when they get in the house? So we're going to talk a lot more about those. We're also going to talk about the influence of implicit bias, stereotype, and prejudice. I want to uh, talk about differentiating between equality and equity. Equality means everyone gets the same thing. Everything's equal. If everyone gets a bike, they're all getting the same bicycle. One in four persons are going to have their needs met if we only look at equality. If we look at equity, the person who has some physical limitations are going to get a bicycle that they can use to help improve their health and to help with transportation. A person who has a taller statue, stature is going to be able to have a bigger bike. The woman can have a bike, the average woman size, she can have a bike that fits, and a child can have a bike that works for them. I want to do an uh, exercise, if I can, if I could have um, eight volunteers come down here in Signature. It's nothing too risky. Two, four, six, seven. I need one more. There we go. Thank you, Sheila. Just pick a chair, any chair. Oh, sure. I'll sit in the back. <laughs> We need one, oh, two more. Yeah, there you go. All right. This is a demonstration of equity and equality. And it demonstrates that we don't know everybody's personal story. And people's story goes far beyond what we see. And we don't know that story until we ask, okay? So from an equality perspective, everybody here has been given 20,000 social determinants of health dollars, okay? So it's all equal. Everybody gets the same thing. All they have to do is deposit their money in the bank, and they can double their money. When you deposit your money in the bank, that's this. It's not as good as your bank who hosted this, but this is the best I could do today. We could put an emblem on it next time. <laughs> but um, without getting out of your seat, all you have to do, I want you to read your story and the social determinants of health, read your story, and then try to get your money into the bank. So we'll start in the back. I am a transgendered. My parents kicked me out of the house because they were embarrassed. I couch surfed to find a place to sleep. It is not safe on the street. I'm learning where I can find food that does not cost money, or I don't have to turn a, a trick to eat. Okay. So one thing I'll say about transgendered and some of the culture of the LTGBQIA, a lot of the homeless youth in Des Moines, and they have food shelters um, where they can go to get food. Most of them are self-described as throwaway kids. They're throwaway kids because their parents were uncomfortable with their identity of being transgendered. The most common reason that youth are homeless is because of their sexual identity. What are some other social determinants of health that, you, that we heard with this? Um, with this person, the transgendered person. Food insecurity. Food insecurity. Housing. Housing. Transport. Transport. Yep. Transportation. The number one reason why persons do not come back for follow-up visits is transportation. About 90% is related to transportation. And so if we're not assessing that, we're not going to get the follow-up that we need. Okay. 
Any other idea? Any other thoughts about transgendered? Okay. Right. That's good. When I rented my home, I did not think it would be a death <coughs> sentence. I have lung cancer from asbestos in the home. As a result, I have lost my employment. I struggle to pay rent, and I no longer have health insurance. My landlord has threatened to evict me. What are some social determinants of health that we see with that? The yes, the built environment. What are some other things specific to that? Insurance. Insurance. Access to health care. What else? Financial insecurity. Financial insecurity. When there's financial insecurity, there's food insecurity. What else? Housing, safe housing. There's asbestos, and then there's a health condition on top of that. What you guys can do, if you want to just put your, get your money, you can't get out of your chair, though. Mm. You're at a disadvantage. <laughs> <laughs> you need to, to get your money into the bank. No, and you have. <laughs> well, that's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> no, nice shot. Almost. <laughs> well, right. Well, we just gave them the money, and so they could put it in the bank, but they probably don't have a bank account. You're exactly right, which is an assumption. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Go ahead. It's right. true. Um, I was incarcerated and had a felony charge. I served my time. I'm still being judged for my past. People do not trust me. I cannot secure housing or meaningful employment. They do not believe I have changed. How can I prove myself? What are some social determinants of health and barriers that we see with this person? Bias. Bias, exactly. Absolutely bias. What else? Probably lacking adequate support systems. Exactly. Adequate, lacking adequate support system. Housing. Housing. Financial. Financial. Food. Food. Exactly. Because of that bias and because of that previous lived experience, that sets up a whole array of social determinants of health that we could assist this person with. Okay. I am legally blind. I recently lost my spouse of 62 years. I depended on them for so many things. I do not know if I can live on my own anymore. It is very hard to figure out how to get to the grocery store or my appointments on my own. I feel so lost. What social determinants of health do we identify there? Built environment. Built environment, absolutely. Lack of support system. Lack of support system. Transportation. Education, is that what you said? Transportation. Transportation, Transportation. absolutely. What else? If she can't get to the store mm -hmm. for food. We have food insecurity. <laughs> what about isolation and loneliness? How does that affect our health? Especially when she's grieving the loss of her husband of multiple years and she's blind. Okay. You guys can put your money in the bank. I got teased at school because I am overweight. My parents don't have much money to buy groceries. The closest grocery store is four miles away and we don't have a car. We walk to McDonald's. That doesn't cost us as much money as groceries. Okay. What are some social determinants of health we see with this person? Financial. Money. Money. Finances, right? Food desert. Food desert. Yeah. What else? Transportation. Transportation. So if they're getting bullied at school because of their weight, <clears throat> what about access to quality education? Mm -hmm. And then self-esteem. And when your self-esteem is beaten up as a kid, are you going to participate in activities that mainstream kids fit in, or are you going to retract from that? It is a general rule. 
it's a very, kids are mean. <laughs> so, go ahead. Okay. I am new to America. Your healthcare ways are very different from what I am used to. It is difficult to understand why I, have a, why I have a failing heart and how to feel better. There are so many appointments, medicines, and doctor visits. What are some social determinants of health you see with this person? Language, yeah. Language health, literacy. If they're having difficulty understanding how to their appointments and the needs, transportation, what else? Would there be isolation, perhaps, if there's not, uh, if there's a communication barrier? And then isolation um, and all that, this equality that happens with isolation, exactly. You guys can deposit your money, if you will. I am a single parent working two minimum wage jobs to support my three children. I did not ask my partner to leave, to not pay child support, or not be involved in my children's lives. I am doing the best I can. <coughs> what social determinants of health do you see with this person? Financial. Financial. Money, lack of support. <coughs> Bless you. Education, because the kids are likely unsupervised. Yep. Education, access to quality education. It could be food security in terms of transportation if, if she's working two jobs. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Kishula. <laughs> I'm a farmer living in a rural community. I have to go in every six months to get my prescriptions refilled. The closest clinic is 60 minutes from my home. It's hard for me to go to the clinic because I do not have farm help. And the clinic is only open from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. What are some social determinants or barriers here? Transportation. Lack of support. Lack of support. Lack of access to care. A lot of access to care. Rural populations have much more health disparities and adverse health outcomes because of access to care, especially cardiac, because they live so far away. And by the time they recognize they need to go negotiate all those things that you talked about, what am I going to do? How am I going to get there? I have farm work to do. And that is a lot of the population that we serve here in Ames. Persons travel a long distance to come to Ames. So, all right, you can throw your dollars deposit. Oh, nice, very good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. All right. So, the purpose of looking at this is even though we talk about equality, everybody getting the same number, there's different barriers that there are to make to do the same. So as we talk about, you know, I work also and I manage to make it. We don't know what is in their image, what they're, what they're dealing with, what are the, some of the barriers. And that is tearing down some of those prejudices and stereotypes so that we can care for the individual and give the need that, give the care that they need and not do, for example, routine um, discharge instructions. Because if they don't have transportation, it doesn't matter if we're telling them they need to come back in a week. If they can't get there, they won't be able to get there. If we ask them to do other care, but they don't have access to that, they're not going to be able to do that. And so those assessments of social determinants of health need to start an admission and reassess throughout. Okay, thank you very much. You can leave your scenarios on the table, on the chairs if you would. Okay. Okay. I want to talk about upstream factors. How many of you are aware of upstream factors? Okay. I'm going to um, give you a, a scenario, then we'll talk a little more details about that. Upstream factors. Um, say there is a stream, and these three friends 
are walking along the river. Let's call it a river. They're walking along the river. And as they're walking, they see there's a lot of people have fallen in the river. So the first friend says, you know what? There's a waterfall up ahead. I'm going to put a net up here so that this net can stop anyone from getting hurt more when they fall over the, when they fall over the waterfall. The other two keep walking, and the, the second one says, you know what? All these people are just floating in the river, and they're heading down. I'm going to have these life vests. I'm going to throw it out to them and pull them to shore safely and so that I can get them out and, and help them. And the third person continues to walk. And they said, hey, where are you going? And the person said, you know what? I'm going to go upstream, and I'm going to find out why they're falling in the water in the first place. That's the upstream factors. So that first upstream factors is to say, how can we promote health? How can we care for them before they fall in the stream? This is looking at what policy can we do? What access do we have to help persons in rural communities? How engaged are we in meeting patients, even routine appointments, to see what their limitations are to achieving health. The midstream factors are those persons that you see who are coming in for problems or who are hospitalized. How do we help them to navigate, navigate the rapids? How do we help them to navigate the stream so they can get themselves off out before they fall over that waterfall? And then the downstream is where we focus on rehabilitation, restoration, and repatterning. They have a diagnosis that is sending them over the edge. They have a diagnosis of cancer. They're losing a limb. They're doing things that they have to restructure their lives. How do we help them to navigate those rapids so they don't fall over the waterfall? What kind of assessment are we doing so we can help them with these upstream factors? So I gave you... Um, a case study, and we're going to just talk about this, and I hopefully have, so we have a half hour left, is that right? Okay, perfect. I want you to kind of just get in groups around you, if you would, and I want you to open number one. This is Dina number one. I want to reiterate that this is a real life case study, okay? I want you to open up number one, read it out loud in your group, then I want you to talk about some of the concerns that you see in terms of implicit bias, social determinants of health, and uh, then we'll come back and talk about those. So I'm going to give you probably five-ish minutes to read that and talk. <laughs> All right, let's just come back together. I'd like to get through two case studies if we can. Um, so tell me what are some of your initial thoughts about Dina? Bias based on her gender and housing. There's a lot of bias based on her lack of insurance and housing. The assumption that she's a narcotic user. The assumption that she was a narcotic user, that she was there for, she was seeking narcotics. Which kind of was a group think as it went through, isn't it? The, the tone was set as soon as she walked in the door that then permeated the whole way through her visit in this ER. What else? Lack of quality care. Did they do an assessment? They didn't even, they didn't do an assessment. What else? I don't know how she's going to get these pain meds if they're not yeah. gave her a prescription, but she probably can't afford to go get them or have a way to go to a pharmacy and get them. Right. How is she going to get this prescription? I will tell you that this was 1230 in the morning. They did not give her medications there. They gave her a prescription. And then um, what else? What about her access to care? She's not going to make it to her follow-up. She's not going to make it to her follow-up appointment. If, and she's expected to call to make her own follow-up. And they're sending her back home to where? Nowhere. Nowhere. 
to her, to her she, lived, she lived in a hooch mm-hmm. in the woods by a river. And so if she is having this level of pain, how will she manage it in that environment? What about human dignity and ethics? So I have to show you, this is a picture of Dina. Good Lord. Even after assessment, she clearly had a prolapsed colon, they sent her home. If it were you or I, assuming we were perceived as you know, someone who has insurance, who's educated, who, and this was the advocate who continued to advocate for her at that visit. She got sent home with this. How many of us would get sent home? Zero. How many of us, they would have called a gastroenterologist for surgery while she was there? Let alone make her own appointment. The implicit or explicit bias that happened with Dina, the prejudice, the assumptions of stereotypes absolutely affected her care. The other part, how do you communicate with a colleague who isn't giving appropriate care? Do you have a discussion on your unit or in your clinic about what is a safe way to talk about that, to keep your work culture okay, but not to have this happen? Something we should probably consider. I want you to open Dina number two. Read about that. I'll just give you a couple minutes to look at that. It's shorter. So what are your thoughts about Dina, the progression of Dina? I didn't have warm, clean water. Yeah. Right. Warm, clean water. So I, so perfect. I mean, she got routine discharge orders. They were not considering her social determinants of health. The other part, how relevant is nutrition on healing? Extremely. There's no discussion about that with Dina. So they did give her sterile supplies to take with her. No water, but bandages. So what happens when Dina goes home to her tent? What happens to those? They go on the floor of the tent. What about the amount of time before she was discharged? Two days after, um, after she repaired the prolapse and three days after an ileostomy, when she's going back to that environment, or even if she wasn't, is that standard? And do we have to consider that with where Dina was going? What other options could we give in her so that she could have a safe environment? Is there places here in Ames that she could go to to stay that wasn't a a hooch? There are. There is a lot of options here in Ames. Let me open Dina number three. Who's responsible for Dina's death? Anyone who provided care for her. Anyone who saw her? What is the accountability? The responsibility? That should go to Dina. 
that takes you way back to that very first visit that set off the sequelae that led to her death. She potentially took longer to go back to the ER after being treated that way the first time. Yeah. You know what? She, it did take her a little while to go back that third time. She waited until she was very sick which probably had something to do with the trust of the system, right? Okay. So I want to talk about, do we have time to do Chris? Okay, I want to, um, we're going to do one more case study, and this is a, uh, another case study. I can pass them on one side. Okay, um, so we're going to do another one. We talk about Chris, and again, um, Chris is a, a true story. But I want you to think about what is your attitude when we go back to Dina on homelessness? That she wasn't worthy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> right. That's a lot of where implicit bias comes from. And I tell you, implicit bias is hard. Um, but it's something that if we look at cultural humility, that means we're always thinking about how can we improve? And we can admit that we don't know everything and that we make mistakes, but we work to improve those. I'm gonna let you read about Chris and I'll give you about four-ish minutes and then let's talk about Chris. Tell me your thoughts about Chris. A lot of bias. A lot of bias. Where did the bias begin? The receptionist. Checking. When they checked when he checked in. Mm -hmm. Every single person, I don't know what all your roles are, but whatever your role is does not matter. It's an important role for healthcare outcomes. Whether you're someone who is in the hallway, if you're someone greeting at the front desk when you walk into Mary Greeley, if you're a nurse at the bedside, if you're a provider, if you're a volunteer, Every single person has a role that affects outcome. And both of these actually started prior to them seeing a healthcare provider. Cannot underestimate the role that everybody has in patient care. There was a lot of bias here. What were some other things? Their uncomfortableness. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. glaring to me that you... Mm -hmm. Would feel that way yeah. in it's, a medical environment. Yeah. It's glaring that they would feel that way in a medical environment. They didn't do their jobs. They didn't do their jobs. When there is someone who is in, um, uh, in the LTGBQIA community, it is very difficult, especially if they're transgender, to go in for care on, their, um, on the gender that they're not affirming. It was very difficult for Chris to go into that gynecology office. Even if Chris identified as a female, but was gay or considering affirming, a speculum, a GYN exam is very intimidating. There are only a few clinics in Iowa that specifically serve LTGBQIA persons. And, and if we have the sensitivity and are aware of biases and acknowledge if we have them, because that's the only way we're going to improve it, that's the only way we're going to improve these health outcomes. What else happened that were concerning? The physician's willingness to 
lie about what was done, where he was going to just avoid. The physician's willingness to avoid seeing this patient. Can I tell you something? Of course, in court, they looked at that. There was no delivery that day. That person just declined care because of bias, prejudice, stereotyping, discrimination. And those things are that social context. Because if you're not welcome in your social environment, whether that is at Mary Greeley, whether that's in the clinic, whether that's at a restaurant, wherever that is, that social context changes that access to care. And as we talked about with the examples we gave here, how that contributes to loneliness, isolation, low self-esteem, which all contribute to health disparities and poor health outcomes. Again, Chris died because someone didn't give him care, because of a bias, and literally just refused to see Chris. There wasn't a delivery. Knowing's not enough. We need to take action. We are advocates. First of all, thank you for coming. The fact that you're here, here says that you care. We have to be able to speak up. And we need to have a pact about, hey, you know what? If I challenge you on that, it's because we're looking for the best patient outcomes. We're a magnet. That's part of what we do. And determine that and wherever you work, whether it's a clinic, whether it's your unit, where, whatever role you have, whatever is your work environment, have that pact to say, hey, help me understand why we didn't see Chris. Or to say, if you're not comfortable seeing Chris, let's see if we can get another provider who can see Chris. We have to be able to communicate that, and that's part of the cultural humility. It's part of cultural competence. And it's part of being a provider at any level. It's part of our social commitment. So take action. Any questions about social determinants of health before I switch gears here? Um, for those of you who are interested, um, and this is available free online, um, this is the workbook that Carla and I authored, and this has five case studies that address social determinants of health. Um, first, we have Stanley, and he's in the acute care setting, and we are looking at chronic care management. And what are some considerations so that we can look at social determinants of health and respond to them so we don't have examples of patients that we see being talked about in presentations or in court. What are some considerations? Then Stanley goes home. And what are some of the chronic care management that happens at home that's different than in the acute care setting? How do we assess the home so that they're safe? The community environment? How can we prepare Stanley for that? Then Reese is hospice and palliative care. What are some considerations in providing care? What are some social determinants of health and how can I affect those outcomes in patients who um, are in hospice or receiving palliative care? Jacqueline is telemetry. And this is about restorative and regenerative care. This is part of what we talked about navigating the waters. How do we help Jacqueline from going over that waterfall? How do we repattern, restore, rehabilitate? What kind of support do we give for that? And then Chloe is our little ped, uh, our little ped patient, and we're talking about disease prevention and health promotion. And how can we do that um, in these populations? If you download the book, and we'll give you, there's a, a link, a QR code I'll give you so you can have it. Carla and I intentionally did not sell this workbook. The reason why it's not for sale 
is because it is more important that people have access to it so that we can improve quality of care by looking at social determinants of health. Each one of the case studies in the book um, has learning objectives that you, this would be a great thing that you could even do on your units in huddles. What are the concepts that are related to him, the exemplar COPD, and those social, de uh, social determinants of health, the domains? And then here's an initial scenario, and then it goes through six frames. How do you recognize and, and works through those? And it has a chart. It's some have set up in patients' charts so that you can look through those, look for certain information. And then they have think deeper questions at the end. Some good conversations that we can look at in the patients that we take care of. For um, access, it's a QR code. Um, you also have my card if you have questions. We are very, very happy to address questions. If you have questions after you go back to your units or to wherever your workplace is and have questions, call us. We at Iowa State are committed to Mary Greeley. And we thank Mary Greeley for being committed to us. So if you have questions, please let us know. You can download this um, for free. Then um, I'll go back to that slide. Um, any questions that I can help you with? Comments, notes of sarcasm? I should be careful. I'll take it all. <laughs> Right. And then if you would do me one more favor, um, this is an evaluation, it's just five questions. If you would please just download that and fill that out for us, that would be very helpful. So how we can improve, um, we're interested in feedback. Um, both Carla and I are passionate about social determinants of health. We're passionate about disseminating this information and, um, and we're interested in your feedback. We will both be available if you have questions. Um, thank you for your engagement. And thank you for being here. And thank you for what you do. We'll be available for questions if you have. I'm just going to take off my mic. So. You want these back? Um, you could just leave them on the tables, at the, the envelopes, and we'll get those. You're welcome to take the case studies with you. And hopefully they can stimulate some conversation in different environments.